Thank you for joining us today. My name is Larissa DeLuna with the American Heart Association. We're going to go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the American Heart Association Southwest Affiliates webinar focused on Mission Lifeline and Action to Strike It with the Guidelines. Today is the um, second part of a two-part webinar series that we have been holding. Before we get started um, with our webinar today, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. To avoid background noise, all lines have been placed on mute. To edit your line, press star six to, a to ask a question. All slides and handouts will be available and sent to you within one week of today's webinar. We're also posting a recording to our website, www.heart.org slash SWA quality, um, that you can view. Our today is Molly Perini, Mission Lifeline Director for the Northeast Founders Affiliate. Molly has been with the American Heart Association for over two years. Prior to working at the AHA, she managed clinical research in cardiology, anesthesiology, bariatric surgery, and general surgery. During one time, she also served as the STEMI coordinator for a hospital in Brooklyn, New York, who participated in Mission Lifeline. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Molly. Great, you, Larissa. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, today, I've got a couple of things that I'd like to cover with you all, and uh, I'll make sure that I leave plenty of time at the end for any questions you might have. I'll uh, go through today the data collection tool, the abstraction process, and entry process. Talk about the data elements and tips and hints on those. Go through dashboard, how to really utilize the data that you're putting into the tool. Actually, to do what's called patient level drill downs, and I'll walk us through those. We'll find the data extract again and make sure that I highlight a couple of things I think are uh, instrumental in tracking with the data extract and especially when looking at calculating a preliminary or prediction of what your mission lifeline report measures might look like. So without further ado, we'll jump right in. Just a reminder as to where we're going to be accessing the data portion of the registry. Uh, when you log into NCDR, especially if you participate in other registries, you'll need to make sure that you do click on Action Registry and then once you get here, we're going to look specifically at the data home page. There are a lot of good pieces of information here that I just want to highlight first before we jump right into the entry and abstraction process for the registry as well. First, a call for schedule. Um, and this outlines when the deadlines are. Uh, as you all know, they occur two months after the close of the quarter. So we're coming up on our quarter one deadline now. Uh, which is going to be the end of this month, May 31st at midnight. A comment that from someone that you can't hear. Larissa, you guys can hear me, correct? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, great. Um, okay, so uh, the deadlines for the submission do occur two months after the close of the quarter, but we always encourage sites to start entering data as, as soon as they possibly can. Uh, and the reason being that the uh, uh, more prospectively you enter the data, the more you'll be able to utilize that and bring reports back to your team specific to data drill down and the data extract functions that I'm going to show you in a little bit. You'll, you'll begin to see why it's so useful to go ahead and try and enter your data in earlier than those quarterly deadlines uh, do give us some leeway should we need to take advantage of it, but not only a best practice for utilizing the registry is to enter your data often and early. We're going to go, and this is specific for folks that are utilizing the ACC tool to enter the data. If you use a vendor to submit data to Action Registry, this process is going to be a little bit different for you all and um, is going to of uploading your data rather than using what's called the data collection tool. If you have questions about the vendor specific items, we usually recommend that you reach out to your vendor and, and ask questions about um, the process for preparing the upload. But today, I'm going to specifically focus on the ACC data collection tool. Um, so if you click on that, you will uh, be given a menu on the left-hand side that includes NCBR maintenance. Uh, I do believe um, was reviewed earlier, and it does house a lot of good pieces of, of preliminary data that are helpful to enter in ahead of time, such as 
the transferring facility ID, uh, provider MPI numbers that are now required for submission um, in this registry. The maintenance tab is also where we will find the data extract function, and I'll show that again later when we cover that portion. Go to the data collection tool, um, and we are going to enter in a case. The first thing we're going to do is do patient search, and this is where we enter in that basic demographic information on that case. Through enter in all the pieces of information that you would need. Um, one comment here while we're looking at it is the other ID section. This is where you would actually enter in your hospital medical record number if you want to track that. The ID that is assigned uh, is, is assigned by the NCDR uh, database. But if you use other ID, then that's a helpful way to track the medical record number for your cases so you can look them up easily in your records should you follow up on a case address any issues uh, with the timing intervals that were submitted or review it as an outlier as well. So once you're in the demographic information, you will select add patient. Step, you will be taken to the episode piece, uh, which will go through and enter in all of the information pertinent to that case where the patient was taken to the lab. Um, we have here in these next couple slides is what I call a workflow, um, and so I, I'm going to walk us through what that looks like to enter in those cases and uh, tell you a little bit about where the corresponding fields occur on the paper version of the data collection tool. I still think that the paper version of the data collection tool is very useful for sites, and I'll explain that in a minute. So going in and going to the data collection tool under the data tab, you will uh, and to enter in your cases that you've already abstracted from your medical record. You search and create a patient, enter in that demographic information, as I mentioned, and again, the patient is assigned by NCDR, so do make sure you use the other ID field if you are tracking your hospital medical record number. From there, you will uh, see the patient populate you will be able to select their three icons, and it's that middle icon that we're going to look for. That first icon, which looks like a pencil on a pad, is to edit the case and the uh, piece of paper with what looks like an asterisk in the corner is to create an episode of care. And what we're going to do when we're going through this initial time. So uh, as you move through the next couple of screens in the data collection tool, you are populating all the information that you've previously collected for this case. Um, a couple of notes, and this is specific to folks that are using the limited form. Um, there is a premier form and a limited form for data collection. And uh, this is where it's really helpful to utilize the paper tools because the RGL in the uh, online tool is going to be the only indicator that that is a limited field. The online version of the data collection tool does not change when you switch between a premier and a limited uh, data collection session. You'll need to make sure that you are familiar with which fields you'll specifically need to enter in for the limited form and the way to do that, and the way that I tell my sites is that you're, if you are using the limited form, you are responsible for all the information that is uh, required on that paper tool. That way, when you get to the online version, if you get to a field and you don't have that on your paper tool, you know that you're not responsible for that piece of information. You would save in next to navigate through uh, the tool online. And a view of that ARGL that I mentioned and it's that bottom red arrow. And so you can see it in parentheses in blue text. And so that stands for Action Registry Get What the Guidelines Limited Form. And so are the only way to tell which fields are required by the limited form. For your users, you are entering in all of the fields. So no need to pay attention to that. And if you look on the left-hand menu there, it does show episode, discharge, medications, reperfusion, and procedures clinical events, lab results, optional, and finally, quality check. 
These all correspond to different sections on the data collection tool. And so you can see that the demographic information was what we and what what we entered into the patient add and search section. But if we start with the mission, that's what gets starts to turn into the episode section and follow through the flow of entering that data uh, pertinent to that case. The uh, data quality check, which is that last tab I mentioned, and we'll go back just so I can point it again. So on the left-hand side of that menu, you would go through results past optional. You only need to use the optional fields if that's something that your uh, hospital or region is utilizing to track something. Uh, those are just as they sound optional. Everyone does need to utilize the quality check. That is um, important and essential to reviewing prior to moving on with the case. There's going to be under the data quality check two different types of Notices. There's items to be errors or warnings. So errors are items that need to be resolved. That's likely an issue where uh, the time intervals don't make sense. You say, for example, you noted that the patient's first EKG was in a uh, hospital, but wrote the time down, it occurred prior to their arrival time at the hospital. And so flag that as an error, and those do need to be resolved prior to being able to submit the data through the DQR. Or uh, just to be reviewed, and they are letting you know if a lab value is out of a specific range, um, if, if there are other items that they deem pertinent to bring to your attention, those are considered warnings and don't need to be addressed, they just need to be viewed. So the next step, so we've, say for example, we've gone through, we've added in all of our cases for the particular period that we're looking at. And a reminder, you can submit as often and as many times as you want. So you could, for example, submit your cases from just one week, you could submit months, and you can, of course, submit for the full quarter. And this, the, uh, the bit of entering in your case more frequently is that you'll be able to utilize the dashboard to track your performance and back reports to your providers and to your teams. Um, I always recommend that when hospitals have their Monday AMI STEMI meetings that they bring a version of the patient level drill down for you. It's an opportunity to look at the cases and get a snapshot of which ones you want to review as outliers but also as one that you want to celebrate for success. Then uh, the cases that we're interested in entering, and we want to go ahead and submit those now. That way can be uh, tagged and put into the dashboard. So we're going to use the DQR, which um, is again found under our NCDR maintenance section, and there will be a tab there that says submit to DQR, and you can see a screenshot of that there on the right hand side. There, they list the quarters that are available to submit. It will show you the number of patients you have, the number of episodes, any bookmarks you might have placed. So a bookmark in your index, and you have to flag something to go back and review it. Um, you can place a mark on that case. That way you know exactly where you were in the tool when you wanted to go back and review what piece of information was in question. And so it'll you know how many of those you have outstanding. And finally, system alerts. And this is the important part to address prior to submission. So you need to have zero system alerts in order to be able to submit your data for the quarter. And system alerts correspond to the data quality check, which is the last section of the data collection tool. So if you do have any system alerts, there will be a blue hyperlinked number. You can click directly on that number and it will take you to a list of cases uh, with, within which you have to go back and review the uh, data quality check and address, again, address any errors and review any warnings. The errors need to be fixed. The warnings just need to be viewed. This is also true of any time you edit the data. So say you have submitted once and you realize that you've made a mistake 
mistake, you go back in, edit that case, and resubmit that data. But when you begin and edit that case, you do need to, again, at least view the data quality check. If there are no warnings and no errors, you do need to at least view the data quality check tab. Now, zero system alerts were ready to submit. The checkbox next to the appropriate quarter that you'd like to submit, and either submit with or without DPI. DPI is the direct patient identifiers, and NCR does explain that, that makes it easier for case reference, but that is completely up to your site. Uh, it takes a few minutes to run through uh, the checks that they have. It's assessing for a couple of different things. It's assessing for the errors in the data, and it's assessing for completeness. Uh, after it runs through those checks, it's going to take you to DQR results. You must have a green status to be included in the mission life reports. Uh, it would indicate that there are data issues, and a yellow would mean that there are missing elements. Both of them can address, and again, resubmit once we fix those issues. I'm going to explain how to find out exactly which of those issues you may need to address. Um, first, um, you would view the DQR results under the, that section of the data tab. Uh, if we recall back to our initial view of the options under that data uh, tab, you note that there is a DQR section. And that lists all of the submissions that you've uh, previously submitted. So you can look and see whether or not you were successful and exactly when you submitted the data. The important point to that is that with the quarterly deadlines, and if you are waiting to submit until that final deadline, which is two months after the close of the quarter, you need to ensure that your data is submitted prior to midnight on that deadline. And so the timestamp will help you with that. Uh, but again, we certainly don't recommend waiting until the last minute to submit the data, especially if you get a yellow or red result back. Um, our teams are able to help walk you through uh, correcting those errors, and it certainly helps everyone if we do have some more leeway in timing to address those. So now to the DQR results section, uh, you would view the submission results, and um, under there, you would click on the blue hyperlink text that says fail. And that depends on what type of fail it is as to what type of correction you'll need to make. And number one in the screenshot is under the column that says data assessment. I know it's really small and you can't see. But when you submit your data, this should look very familiar. And if you've already submitted your data, when you get there, um, it'll be helpful to at least have this snapshot to look at and then see what results you got. So the first column would tell us the assessment, and number one corresponds to a fail there. That means that there are issues within the data that need to be addressed. So we click on the word fail and you review the description of the error, it would show you the elements and the cases that you need to address. And you can go back in, find those cases, and uh, fix them and resubmit. This is where it becomes really helpful to have your medical record number entered into that other ID field. Because if you uh, come back and there are either a red or a yellow, and you go back and you look at your paper tool and you realize either it's missing or you haven't, uh, you have actually, in fact, entered what was written on the paper tool, but there's still an error, it makes it easier to go back into your medical records and follow up on uh, looking at that a little bit further. So it's helpful to have that. That way you can easily reference it. It's status, and this is what most of our sites get back, I would say, generally speaking, um, when read uh, a returned red result, um, usually because um, it's an incomplete submission, rather than you're ready to submit and you believe everything is in order. What we do frequently get back is a yellow status, and that would mean that there are incomplete fields. Fields in the action registry have a threshold that corresponds to the number of cases, the minimum number of cases that need to be entered. 
And so, um, as we all know, in the medical field, there isn't always perfect documentation of everything that we need you to abstract for this registry. And so there, are, there is some way in some of those measures where they may only require that it's enter 80% of the time. We, of course, want you to try to get it as often as possible, but understand that there may be instances when that data is just simply not available in the medical record, and so we try to compensate for that. However, um, there are minimum thresholds, so we do need to at least meet uh, the minimum number of uh, entered fields for each particular measure. And um, there's a DQR reference guide that has all those thresholds listed out so that you can reference them if you have any questions about a specific matter. I certainly have them all memorized, and very often when I'm working with a site to look at their submission results, I want to talk through exactly how many more cases we need to get correct data for. It helps to have that DQR guide as a handy reference. Uh, the yellow status, and that's in that second column, which corresponds to number two on the screenshot. That goes under the completeness assessment. You click on the word fail, and it takes you to a separate page. There's going to be two tables on this page. The second table is what we're interested in. The second table shows us the benchmark inclusion detail, and that allows us to view the missing element issues. I do recommend clicking on the missing column heading to sort by uh, the element titles. Um, and that you can see exactly uh, what elements are missing. And then from there, you would click on the page. Uh, you would click on the actual element title itself, and it would give you a list of which patients uh, have that field missing, and the ability to track those down. You can decide. So the steps for finding out exactly which elements are missing is first um, under that benchmark inclusion detail table by the missing column just by clicking on the heading missing and all of the elements that are considered incomplete for this submission. If you click on the element title, it takes you then to a list of all of the patients for which this element is missing. You can download that report of patients or you can jot them down um, so that you can reference them when you need to go back and update those missing fields. So now you have um, which of your, not only which of your patients are miss, missing which elements, but also uh, which elements are also missing. And so this is where it's helpful to have that DQR guide to reference the thresholds, because there may be ones where you just only need to get one of the cases uh, completed rather than all four of the cases that are missing hypothetically. And so it does help to have that to reference. Uh, again, you'll want to download that report so you can follow up on those cases and resubmit the data. Um, when going back in to edit the cases, you will go to uh, <clears throat> either the patient search ad or the episode search and ad. Um, I recommend find using the episode search ad to find the specific case you're talking about. By any uh, piece of information that can be patient's first name, last name, uh, medical record number, whatever piece of identifying information you've jotted down so that you can quickly look up that case. Um, you can look that up under the episode add and search. And remember when I talked about the way to add an episode, there were those three icons. The first of which is that notepad with the pencil on it, and that is the edit button. So that will allow you to edit that specific episode and you'll go to the corresponding section where that element fell, that missing element. You'll enter it, press again, we'll to go and look at the data quality check tab prior to closing the element, uh, prior to qu closing the episode. Um, that way we can at least view any uh, warnings or errors and even if there are none, you do still need to view it. And we can resubmit the data through the DQR. And so this process where we would go to the maintenance section and submit to DQR, you would select 
select the appropriate quarter, ensure again that there are no system alerts, and submit that data. And at that time, it will give you a green status back. back. It covers how we enter the data for the tool. And I can say from experience um, that it certainly does become easier as you move through it. You'll really get a flow and a, a sense of ease with which you move through the entry process. The abstention process is going to be different depending on your hospital and how uh, your medical records work together. Um, but we'll certainly recommend, and I'll, I'll point this out again at the end, is it's really helpful when you're starting off abstracting this data is to map out the sources for the data. That way it's consistent and way if, say, for example, you're out for a week and you know that your team needs to finish up a couple of cases, you have a reference document for them, which can be a printed version of the data collection tool, where you have on there noted where you pull each of those fields from. That way it's easy for somebody to replicate should you be unavailable to help with the abstraction process. The process, as you move through it, again, it gets easy. It's pretty, um, the tool, as you press tab and move through it, it allows you to quickly get through that, and you guys will be pressed before you know it. So forward. we've got all of our data entered, and how do we get to use that? And so this is the fun part. So the dashboard is a really useful uh, part of this tool, um, and it enables us to pull performance on metrics as of those quarterly mission lifeline reports. Um, all of your hospitals will get still get quarterly mission lifeline reports, which have some great um, snapshots for us on there of the data and some browns of the data as well. But again, to really utilize the tool to the best that you could uh, would be to enter in the data as uh, frequently as you decide and to pull those reports for your team to look at. And I'm going to go through what that looks like. Board, um, there are several sections that I want to draw our attention to. Um, it's a good um, page to visit often. The top left corner, which is the data submission status, and I have that enlarged in the center of the screen as well, it shows you the quarter, the upload time, the status, and the submission type, all useful pieces of information. Uh, the upload time and status does correspond to the most recent submission, so just keep that in mind. Um, we want to look and see whether or not you did, in fact, meet the deadline for the Mission Lifeline reports. Um, it will be useful to go back and look at your DQR section where it will show you a list of all of your submissions rather than just the most recent. Um, both of the data submission stats are the outcomes reports, and so those are the NCDR Action Industry Outcomes reports, and they're now available in both a PDF and an Excel format. It is a quarterly version of the executive summary and corresponding measures in the dashboard. So if you want to look at that data in that format, you're welcome to do so. so finally, below that is where we find our mission lifeline reports, and these are under the additional reports section. Uh, so the mission lifeline reports, again, are posted quarterly, but how do we use the dashboard in the interim? Aggregated every Sunday, just keep that in mind. So that means that data that you submit on Friday is going to be available for you next Monday. But if you resubmit data that's the following Monday, it's not going to be available until a week from that date. Um, occur over the weekend, and then the dashboard will update according to whatever um, updates you've made to the data and in your most recent submission. Uh, the way the dashboard is organized, the executive summary, there, there are several heading columns, or uh, heading categories, rather. The composite performance measures. In the left-hand side, we have our arrival performance measures, our arrival quality metrics. We then discharge performance measures and our discharge quality metrics as well. And so there um, are several um, elements under each of these sections that are useful to look at, and I do recommend familiarizing yourself with them. 
What you see on the executive summary is a rolling four quarter. So your my hospital is actually going to be your, your rolling four quarter from whatever ending time frame you've selected at the top. So if you go to the top under that, fir that first blue bar in the middle section on the top, it says an e-reports dashboard, and this is ending time frame. And so you can adjust that accordingly if you want to see a different rolling four quarters. The uh, column after the My Hospital section is uh, an A and B. And it lets you note or uh, visually just quickly glance through and see whether or not you fell above or below the US 50 percentile, which is that third column. The column again is a rolling four quarters for the US 50 percentile. Support the um, executive summary dashboard, but I do think it's a really useful function of the dashboard is the patient level drill down as, as well. If you were to go to one of the uh, additional tabs, and you can see uh, that red circle that says executive summary is, if you follow that along to the right, you can see composite performance measures, arrival performance measures, et cetera, and those correspond to those different categories that I mentioned. And each of those, it's going to show a little bit more detail for each of those measures in the form of a uh, bar chart where it, it has uh, the rolling four quarters mapped out. And you can see a snapshot of your trends over the time, over time, rather than on the executive summary, seeing the rolling four quarters grouped together. The A and B, those are just a nice visual representation of where or not for that particular measure you fell above or below the U.S. 50 percentile uh, for that specific measure. And this is uh, the chart that I mentioned. So this is where we've gone into the conformance performance performance measures section. And you can see the bars uh, over the previous rolling four quarters. And you can see trends. And so if you were to click on those bars, it would take you to the patient level drill down and show you exactly which cases are included in that particular quarter. A reminder for the patient level drill downs is to make sure you turn off your pop-up blockers. Um, let's open up a new tab and you won't be able to get to the data unless you do so. So, patient level drill downs. So, it's a good way to quickly go through and see um, your outliers. Um, so this is an example where we've looked at uh, one of the composite measures, and so it's got all of these that are included in that composite score, and and each row corresponds to a different patient. Each column is a different measure that wraps up into that, that compo composite score, and uh, you go through and see your yeses and your noes. So noes would be considered liars for those particular measures. So you look to the fourth column, the evaluation of uh, LV systolic function, and go to the fourth patient down, you can see that no, they did do an evaluation. Um, that would be a fallout for that case. And then if you go to cardiac rehab referral, which is the last column, and you go to the third case, you can see that that patient did not receive a cardiac rehab referral. And so these provide a, a platform for you to take this data and then, then follow up on those outliers. Uh, Porn drill down is a really great uh, way to do this as well. So when it opens up the uh, tool, it does have it in a uh, web format. But if you prefer Excel, I certainly do. I think it's easier to manipulate and then um, easy to print and make sure that I have uh, actually viewed um, all of the cases as well. Uh, in this patient level drill down, you can do a couple of things here under that filter panel. The first is you can adjust the quarter. So say you originally opened up uh, quarter three, but you want to back and look at quarter two as well. So you can select quarter two under the drop-down menu for the year quarter and press retrieve, and that will update the patient level detail report, which is toward the bottom of the page. I will be shown there. Um, another thing to keep in mind, um, particularly when thinking of the mission lifeline 
STEMI reports and then the Mission Lifeline non-STEMI reports uh, that give you under the filter panel the ability to select either STEMI, non-STEMI together or separately. Um, so just make sure to keep that in mind when you go to look at some of your uh, measures that are perhaps relevant to both populations. You will not update based on anything you change in the filter panel, so also keep that in mind. Um, if you do filter for just the STEM population or semi-population in a measure that does, does include both, you will need to go through and uh, calculate the compliance percentages rather than rely on what's in that metric summary. Uh, the other comment that I wanted to make on this page was at the bottom where it says page down. So measures where there are um, of patients where it's, it's usually 20 or more patients, you will need to go and press page down to continue to view the remainder of your cases. So keep that in if you're using the web. And if you download it as an Excel file, which is that export button on the um, middle of the page towards the top, that will include all of your cases for that quarter. So see, especially if you're a facility that has a lot of cases, I do recommend using the Excel and the export functions. Um, one uh, suggestion on how to use the patient level drill town, and this is looking at a sample um, Mission Lifeline regional report. Each of the layers corresponds to a different PCI center, and this is their performance on our Mission Lifeline EMS first medical contact to device measure. And uh, sites will note that their performance may isn't as good as the rest of their colleagues, and so they want to go through and look at their outlier cases and see if they can't draw some commonalities from the outliers and work on addressing um, those via an update to a protocol or an update to a policy so that they can better achieve this FMC to device metric. And so the hospital would then go look and see their individual performance on the Mission Lifeline report and uh, note that they're doing really well except for that Mission Lifeline um, first medical contact to primary PCI, which is the one that's boxed in red now. And so we had 15 opportunities, but we're only at 66.7% for that metric. Um, so this provides a good platform to then go into dashboard and drill down on those cases. Um, we we certainly, um, and talk to my hospitals, like to think of, um, you know, our door balloon time is still on there. We know now that most of hospitals are routinely achieving door to balloon in under 60 minutes, and we need to work on making sure that our strategy of coordination between EMS and the hospital allow for improved performance on this EMS first medical contact device metric which again is our more challenging measure. Um, and these are uh, comparable ARG dashboard metrics for the mission lifeline measures. And so this is specific for our receiving our PCI centers. Um, so the caveat with this is that um, these are to be used as a way to preview what you might expect to see in your mission lifeline report. Um, as I'll talk through in just a minute, specific measure number 37, there are some um, differences between the action registry dashboard and what we see in the mission lifeline report. Um, and so uh, when you do calculate your performance for your mission lifeline report using the uh, dashboard, just keep that in mind. There are going to be some potential differences, and it may not be exactly what you see in the mission lifeline report. And certainly when you do get the Mission Lifeline report and you talk through what those differences are, Mission Lifeline directors are going to be a great resource for that. Um, but I think that it is important to track these measures in a more real-time fashion. So you can bring them to your uh, review committees, to your AMI committees, and discuss ways that you can work on improving your performance prior to those reports coming out. That way, the next quarter, you're already ahead of the game. You're already working on what you think your potential opportunities are, and you can get a jump start on implementing those. That way, the next 
quarter's worth of data will show that improvement. So this is specific to the EMS first medical contact to device measure. And um, a lot of information, so like Larissa mentioned, this is going to be made available to you. Uh, but we want to talk through the two that highlighted and show you how to use those to calculate this. And so these are the differences between the Mission Lifeline Report and the Action Registry Dashboard for the first medical contact to device measure. So for action, if there's a non-EMS first medical contact time, they use arrival time. If there is a STEMI noted only on the subsequent EKG, they use the subsequent EKG as the start time for that case. And that's different from what we do in the Mission Lifeline Report. The Lifeline Report is specific to our EMS first medical contact. And so that is what we use as an inclusion. We so, um, do utilize the subsequent EKGs as start time, but rather that is an exclusion for our Mission Lifeline Report. Um, so are things to keep in mind when looking at the uh, drill down on metric number 37, which is the FMC to device measure. And I'm going, to t I'm going to walk us through how to apply those differences to what you're looking at in the dashboard so you can get a snapshot of what your performance might be. First would be to go to your dashboard and click on the metric number 37 uh, uh, title. And that is a hyperlink, which will take you to the patient level drill down. And this is an enlarged version. Uh, and what I have shown here is the easy way to visually see exactly which cases you'll need to take out of this ARG calculation of FMC to device to get your mission lifeline FMC to device. So the first thing we would need to do is remove cases with no FMC date and time. You look at this example shown here. The first blank we get to under that column is the first case that was on 11 that case we would take out. There is a second case on 1122 with no EMS first medical contact date and time. So we would remove that one as well. What we also need to do is remove any cases with subsequent EKG time. Because that's an exclusion for our mission lifeline report. And so you see that the second case there on 1124 even though they did have a first medical contact date and time, they had subsequent EKG time. And so we would exclude that case. And so they're taken out as well. And three cases would be removed. And then we would be able to see what our FMC to device would look like for mission lifeline. You can do this by exporting it. Again, if you have a hospital that has a lot of cases that fall under this measure, I certainly recommend exporting. That way you can track which ones you've removed um, so that you can calculate your mission lifeline measure. It's easier to filter as well. So this is just a sample where you can go through and pull those measures and look for that hospital and see where you may have fallen out and where you may have done, uh, may have worked on your opportunities and you may have had a better quarter. So it certainly is feasible to get a snapshot of what you may expect to see in the Mission Lifeline report, um, and certainly a good tool to have in your back pocket. And do with the patient level drill down, which is really helpful if you can, um, if you download it as an Excel file, you get a lot more flexibility in what you can do with it. You take the arrival date and time and determine whether the patient came during on hours or off hours. And so is the column that's the fourth column over where we've added in arrival day and hours and you can see where it's listed out uh, and so you can visually tell okay so if you scroll even further over to your FMC to balloon time where that red arrow is pointing you find cases that exceed 90 minutes do they occur during on hours or off hours if they occurred during on hours then we definitely need to look at what may have occurred there but if they during off hours perhaps we need to look at what our process is during off hours and see where there may be some opportunity to address some of the outliers. Uh, 
There is a comparator function under the dashboard as well um, that allows you to compare your hostel's performance to hostels. Certainly something um, of interest um, and does give you some interesting results as well. You're allowed to place filters and group yourself together uh, with a variety of different filters. Um, here are those examples. So the uh, filter criteria can be the type of services you have, what state you're in, uh, it's a rural, urban, or suburban, uh, hospital location, number of beds, etc. And runs a report for you. Let me go back just one. So it runs a report for you, and then it would show you your comparison group, but then also uh, your hospital as well. So most of our uh, regions have regional reports, but you want to look at this independent of that, uh, or look at this with some additional filter slide on it, or see how your hospital is doing compared to hospitals in a different state. You can that as well. So a few minutes and walk us through is the data extract function, and I want to mostly talk about some of the fields that I think are useful to uh, do the data extract with. And you can find this under the NCDR maintenance tab. Um, and you're allowed to select any date range. So you can pick a month, a year, a quarter, whatever time frame it is you're looking at. You can full data extract. Select which of elements you're particularly interested in viewing. Um, as a reminder, it does automatically include your NCDR participation ID, patient's last name, first name, and a couple of other things. That way you can uh, Obviously, assume that those are going to be included in the report. You would download the extract, and you would get an, a, a large Excel file. Uh, as you go through and select the different fields, just remember to hold Control as you click through. Get a Excel sheet that allows you to filter, hide fields that you're no longer interested in, and do a lot more calculations. This is a raw version of the data, though, so it will not have calculated things things for you, just keep that in mind. Okay. So when I mentioned that there are a couple of recommendations that we use uh, for which fields to uh, do the data extract for, here's a list of those. So this lets you go through and access the raw data for your first medical contact to device measure. So these different sequence numbers that you would need in order to calculate those. And you can see the coding on the far left so that you can see exactly which of your cases would be included in the uh, min lifeline measure. And these will be available for you so that you can reference them and hope start doing these data extracts to help uh, inform your process improvement at your institution. Uh, since this is raw data, we will need to combine the first medical contact date and time and first date and time in order to calculate our first medical contact time there. So an example of a way to utilize this is um, we encourage that hospitals are sending feedback to their EMS agencies in a real-time format. Uh, most of our hospitals give feedback within two business days to their EMS colleagues. However, you want to give them a more aggregate view of their uh, measures, specifically, for example, to the EMS recognition that we do. These are some of the fields that you could extract from action registry on data you've already entered and that to your EMS agencies. You would need to use um, the EMS agency ID, which is sequence number 3156, to separate them. That way you're not sending agencies other agencies' data, uh, but you can go through and filter by sequence 3156 and identify which of your EMS agencies. That's a field that we're now collecting in Action Registry and enables us to really be able to track this uh, a little bit better. The goal is for your transfer centers, uh, being able to provide them an aggregate view on their performance for these measures and you would use field 3151 to separate the cases by referring centers since we now are looking at the referring center IDs. Just examples of ways to use the data extract. 
Um, you can, again, as I mentioned, you can pull for any period of time, um, and you can look at it in a little bit more detail. So um, a, a good success story I have from one of our hostels up here is they did, uh, they were struggling with door to EKG. And did extracts on their door to EKG, and they were able to delineate between performance for women versus men. And they realized that their uh, door to EKG times for women were prismal. And, and went back through, they, they looked at it in a little bit more detail, and they realized it was because they did not have a area that they could do an EKG with some privacy. So they were taking time and um, uh, making sure the patient felt comfortable and felt that uh, when removing their shirt to do the EKG, uh, they were at least given some privacy. The hospital installed a inexpensive curtain on their EKG area, and now I'm happy to report that they are doing quite well on their door to EKG metric. So just for thought on ways to um, utilize the extract and, and possibilities in your data uh, for where you can focus and, and address your quality goals for the year. I just want to mention that there is interoperability between CAS PDI and Action Registry. Um, in the, um, uh, uh, the deck that will be made available, there are some other details on how that process works. Um, if you had information, I'm not going to go through now in the interest of time. I want to just share a couple of tidbits of information on the elements um, to be helpful on your sites, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, as I mentioned, we're now collecting uh, quite a few more EMS fields, um, and uh, we also, as we have been, are collecting our transferred from outside facility uh, times and some of our metrics around there. I do point out to hospitals, and a lot of my sites come back to me and they say, oh, we can't get this data. Um, but what this is intended to be is a door opener. So when you come across a case where you don't have this information available, that opens up the opportunity to communicate with that EMS agency or with that outside facility and get that information. We tend for it to be a large barrier, and if you have issues with open those channels, that's where us as Men Lifeline Directors can come in and help you. Um, certainly, uh, we want to make sure that we're getting your hospitals to stay beyond just for the purposes of entering into this registry, but for the overall purposes of quality improvement within your what we consider your STEMI system of care. So, under the symptom onset date and time, and this may be something you already know, but a lot of, I get this question quite a lot. Um, this is looking at the um, escalation in symptoms. So we always hear of those patients that, oh, I've had chest pain on and off for three days. Um, but what we're looking for is that escalation of symptoms that prompted them to seek medical attention. And that way, um, that symptom onset would meet um, our inclusion criteria for this registry as well. So keep that in mind. Uh, so specifically, if um, any of you all transfer your patients out, um, and then if any of your non-PCI centers do data abstraction, we want to make sure that they are using a discharge location as other acute care hospital. That way it will gray out a lot of the fields that are required um, and not hold them accountable for, say, for example, discharge medications because we've been sent on to another acute care hospital. Uh, the non-system PCI, uh, non-system reason for day in PCI, um, so the list for their difficult vascular access, PLA in providing consent, cardiac arrest and or need for intubation, difficult processing the culprit lead, and other and none. So there are no non-system reasons for delay. Please do select none. Um, but certainly, um, those can be utilized um, for delays that may occur within your hospital and um, taken into account when calculating the metrics. Um, certainly, don't want to penalize you for something that was related to the clinical condition of the patient was outside of your system's control. Here, what I want to point out is under the reprovision candidate, yes, 
and thrombolytics no. Um, so many of our PCI centers um, will get to this section and they want to know which one is routinely used. Um, expected to balloon is less than 10 minutes, and that's true um, uh, what we code a lot for our transfer cases as well. Um, so keep that in mind. Certainly, if any other, uh, the other codings make more sense, um, put those. But as a default, um, expected door to balloon time less than 90 minutes is what uh, most of our hospitals enter. And to close it out, just a reminder of the resources you have available to follow up on any questions you might have about the um, abstraction, entry, submission, and review in the dashboard. So there is Coder's Dictionary and Full Specification Guide available online under the Resources section. And this ARG FAQ section. Um, you have registry site manager calls and new user calls. There is a call schedule under uh, the education section of resources. I know that's pretty small, but they do have them. There's actually one coming up tomorrow, um, Thursday. Um, her Thursday is at 1 p.m. And there is usually a webinar posted, uh, webinar link posted on the NCDR homepage to access those. Last but certainly not least, um, keep calm and call your AHA QSI director. Um, so we're here as resources to your hospitals. I like to tell my hospitals that to think of me as an extra person on their quality team. Um, when reviewing the data, I don't um, intend to be to come off as somebody who is only a bearer of bad news. I'm there to help you guys work and improve your systems. And I think that all of our directors from the Southwest affiliate would also echo that. So um, certainly make sure that you know who that person is and reach out to them if you have any questions. And that's bad, but I do want to see if we have a few minutes for um Thank you so much, Molly. You did an amazing job. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to to on our webinar today. And if there's any questions, you can go ahead and press star six to come off mute. And I see some questions in the Q&A section, so I'll jump to those first, okay. and then if anybody wants to press star six and ask it out loud. So then we drill down the Mission Lifeline data monthly. So you can use the uh, dashboard metrics that correspond with the Mission Lifeline measures, um, and uh, so that is uh, where I talked through metric number 37 and get a snapshot of what your Mission Lifeline data will look like. But these reports that come out are, are quarterly reports. So you can use the dashboard to view the Mission Lifeline data monthly. But again, keep in mind that there may be some slight differences. And if you have questions specific about the differences, we can only work through those. Uh, how long does it take the Mission Lifeline report if you're just starting with Action Registry? So the uh, data is harvested at that deadline. So if you're just starting with quarter one, say for example, you have cases. January, February, March, submit, entered, ready to go. Um, the data will be harvested for Mission Lifeline reports on that quarter deadline, which is two months after the close of the quarter, so May 31st. Um, we do expect that those reports come out about a month to two months after the close of that quarter. Um, the report the data is sent to DCRI in a raw format, and it is uh, taken and converted into the metrics that we look at specifically. And that's where that uh, lag time occurs. But what you can definitely do in the meantime is use your dashboard. If you have data in there, it's a really great tool. Go in there, play around. You can't hurt the dashboard. Um, you can go in there, play around with it, look at your metrics. You can edit in cases until you go back into the page ad search or episode search ad. Of last week, data track was not functioning. I'm sorry about that. I believe I walked one of my sites through that recently, so I think it's up and running. Um, if it's not, certainly, um, and if you ever have any trouble, you know, NCDR does maintain the dashboard, so they may be your best bet if there's a technical issue, but you're always welcome to loop in your AHA director if you have any questions on that. How does a freestanding ER obtain an AHA number? Uh, so for freestanding ERs, 
Um, w the way that NPR is now uh, asking folks to code for that is actually as a non-EMS first medical contact. Um, and that is specific to the freestanding ERs. And I can um, make sure that we send that updated FAQ uh, out to the listserv so that you can review that. If a non-PCI center that doesn't have an AHA number, you can always call the American Hospital Association and ask them. I've had to do that for a couple of my new hospitals where they didn't have one listed on that form, and we needed to go through and see um, what there was. And so we were able to call the American Hospital Association. I know it's a little confusing, AHA. You would think that it was us, but um, they are quite nice, and they will look it up and let you know if there is an uh, available number. Um, the address is a little bit what I said about the freestanding ERs without the AHA numbers. We can't capture them. Correct. They're not to be captured as transferring sites anymore. They must be captured as a non-EMS first medical contact. Oh, centers are mission life unaccredited. I am pivot that to um, else from the Southwest affiliate. Um, we can certainly look up that number for you. So those are, um, and you're talking about the Mission Lifeline Accreditation to the Society of Cardiovascular Patient Care. Um, if you go to their website, you can actually look up who they are. Uh, but I don't actually have a number off the top of my head. I'm sorry about that. I don't have a number off the top of my head either, so we'd have to look that up, and actually we can reply um, in an email to that question. Sure. But um, like I said, you can look them up. They are online. It's the Society of Cardiovascular Patient Care. They do a nice map interactive map that shows you the different types of accreditation and um, who has that. Um, on the drill down monthly mission lifeline data. Um, so um, we can certainly make sure that we work with which site to, to clear that up. And I'm sorry um, that that uh, was left unclear. Um, the, um, Perhaps what we'll do is we'll create a quick reference. So it just shows you exactly which dashboard measures correspond to the Mission Lifeline measures. That we, um, it's just a one-page reference. Um, again, it's, it's because we use NCDR's action registry to um, enter data for the Mission Lifeline project, that we're using that as our entry point. The action registry measures are just slightly different from the mission lifeline measures, and so um, you need to make sure that you're clear, particularly metric number 37. But use the dashboard to quote unquote calculate our mission lifeline data monthly. But we um, see if there's any other questions on that that you might have that we can clear up for you. Um, Lane, I'm not quite sure with your last question what um, what what is the site, please. Um, certainly, if you want to come off mute and ask, uh, happy to see if I can answer that for you. Uh, the next question is: When we correct the data that has already been published, can we view the changes in the DQR? That's a great question. So, for this already been published, that will not change. There will not be a new report generated for that quarter. Those updates will be taken into account for the rolling four quarters that's available in the Mission Lifeline report, as well as the dashboard, uh, the outcomes report for ARG. Um, after the public data, when you update data and submit it, it is updated in the dashboard. So the dashboard is going to be your most up-to-date version of the data once it is um, I think I kind of bumbled through that a little awkwardly. I hope that made sense. If it's not, um, just let me know. Uh, but the, they not republish a uh, already published report, but in the next course report, when they do show the rolling four quarters, uh, the edits that you've made to previous course will be reflected in that rolling four quarters for subsequent submissions. But then again, your dashboard is going to be your 